In 2016, we will see the continuation of conflicts and rivalries in the Middle East. More countries will get entangled in the Syrian civil war, but we will also see a re-emerging Turkey. The Saudi-Iranian rivalry will reach new heights and Israel will have to rethink its geopolitical position. Further north in Russia, the low oil prices will force Moscow to push hard for economic reforms. Financial changes will also occur in Europe, where many nations will struggle with their economies, which in turn will inspire the rise of nationalism. However, there are also exceptions such as Switzerland, where an important referendum could trigger a financial revolution. In this prognosis, we will go over the most likely diplomatic, economic and military outcomes for Europe, the Middle East and Central Asia in 2016. In part 2 of the prognosis, we will continue on with East Asia, Africa and the Americas. Welcome to a Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. In 2016, we will see a fragmented Europe. Germany and France will start preparing for the general elections in 2017. The Paris attacks and the refugee crisis will play an important role in these elections, but both countries seek different solutions, so we will see the interests of Germany and France start to diverge. An indirect consequence of this will be the strengthening of nationalist political parties across Europe. In Greece, Prime Minister Tsipras will face a dilemma. His challenge will be reforming the pension system. Since almost 25% of Greeks are unemployed, many families depend on the pensions that their elderly members receive. In short, aside the poor economic prospects, the upcoming reforms will lead to social unrest and a new political crisis in Greece. In Portugal and Spain, the political and economic situations will worsen. Lisbon will strive but most likely fail to keep the government coalition intact, which will lead to early elections in Portugal. As for Spain, the country just held its general elections in December 2015, so the leadership will first attempt to form a coalition government. Both Madrid and Lisbon are well aware of the upcoming financial storm and are already working on reforms to tackle these issues. However, the problem here is that these solutions will create the conditions which led to the financial crisis of 2008, so we will see the creation of a new economic bubble. Italy is facing a similar story. Prime Minister Renzi will seek to increase public spending by taking out state loans while at the same time trying to implement economic reforms. His reforms will most likely go ahead, but by taking out state loans whilst the country is already in heavy debts, Renzi is creating the conditions for a new economic bubble. To the north in Switzerland, an exceptional year awaits the nation. The country is planning to hold a referendum to strip commercial banks of the right to produce money. If this referendum passes, it would require banks to back their loans with 100% reserves. The idea is to deprive banks from giving out loans that they are unable to back up. This referendum is really meant to end the economic bubble system, and if this radical shift in policy is approved in Switzerland and catches on in the rest of the world, it would undo three centuries of banking structure and is nothing short of a financial revolution. In the Northwest, the United Kingdom too has an important referendum scheduled for late 2016 or early 2017. The election will be on the country's EU membership and even though most indications point out that London will vote to keep in the European bloc, the referendum does show the fragmentation of the European Union. Eastern Europe awaits a tense year, in which the refugee crisis will lead to more violence in the Balkans. As the weather improves, the flow of refugees will increase and peak in the summer months. However, unlike 2015, the border controls in Europe will be more frequent. This will upset both the refugees as well as the transit Balkan states. Some refugees and migrants may end up as involuntary immigrants in countries that are already experiencing high unemployment and ethnic tensions. Considering these factors, this year there will be a lot more violence in regards to the refugee crisis. 
In the north, the rise of conservative and nationalist parties in Poland and Romania will lead to a new anti-Russian coalition. Warsaw and Bucharest have a lot more at stake in regards to the crisis in Ukraine, and so both countries will campaign for the EU to maintain sanctions against Russia. However, this anti-Russian campaign by Poland and Romania will clash with Germany's energy ties with Russia. This clash of interests of Western and Eastern Europe in regards to Russia will force Warsaw to rely on the Visegrad group, which includes Hungary, the Czech and Slovakia. This coalition in cooperation with Romania will use their influence to play NATO against Russia. In short, in 2016 we will see the continuation of the NATO-Russian standoff in Ukraine. What's more is that the rise of nationalist groups in Ukraine will undermine the government's ability to negotiate a peaceful resolution with the separatist leaders. So the crisis in Ukraine will gradually become a frozen conflict. Under this new status quo, NATO and Russia will seek to deploy missiles and air defense systems in strategic locations such as the Baltics and Belarus. This will stimulate a new NATO-Russian arms race in Eastern Europe, but there will be no direct military confrontation. As for Russia, the country has a difficult year ahead. Western sanctions and low oil prices are forcing the Russians to review their economy. Moscow will withstand the sanctions in 2016, but anything more will severely damage their capability to maintain current levels of energy production. So Russia will spend most of 2016 seeking for ways to re-establish energy contracts with Western companies. Moscow will gradually recover from the economic recession of 2014 as capital flight will drop and industrial production will increase, but the ruble will still remain unstable and we will see an increase in inflation. This basically means that the Russian industrial companies will do fine, but the overall condition for the middle class citizens will decrease. Another big change for Russia in 2016 is that as resources become limited, the internal rivalries between the elite, diplomats, military and security agencies will intensify. However, this will all happen behind the screens and it will not be reflected in the mainstream media. As for the geopolitics of Russia, the country's biggest opponent will not be in Europe, but rather in Turkey. Russia's military involvement in Syria clashes with the interests of Turkey. In 2016, we will see a growing rivalry between Turkey and Russia, and this struggle will expand into regions such as the Caucasus, the Balkans and even Central Asia. The local countries in these regions will be tested. For example, Azerbaijan will face a hard geopolitical decision as both Turkey and Russia will try to use the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to gain influence in Baku. In the Middle East, the Syrian civil war will remain the center of attention and even though the UN is calling for a political solution in Syria, the conditions which are set forth are not feasible within the mentioned timetable. Too many questions remain unaddressed, so for 2016 there is no end in sight for the civil war in Syria. But perhaps the biggest change this year will be the Turkish involvement in Syria. Ankara is preparing for a military operation in northern Syria which will involve ethnic Turkmen and Sunni Arab rebels who are loyal to Ankara. Turkey will seek to use these proxy groups to establish a safe zone in Syria and officially this zone will be justified as a long-term solution to settle the refugee crisis. Unofficially the safe zone will be an occupation meant to prevent the establishment of Kurdish autonomy in Syria and to increase Ankara's role in the domestic affairs of Syria. If the proxy groups fail to achieve their goals, Turkey will mobilize its own forces into Syria. So we will see a lot of American, Turkish and Saudi cooperation in this field. The rise of Turkey, however, will not go smoothly. The collapse of the Turkish-Kurdish peace talks means that the situation will escalate as both sides intend to weaken the other as much as possible. One of the main reasons for the collapse of the negotiations is that the Turkish-based PKK's partner group, the PYD, made significant gains against ISIS. The Turkish leadership worries that cross-border Kurdish solidarity will strengthen the demands for an independent Kurdish state. Turkey's growing role in the Middle East will also clash with the interests of Iran. As a response, 
In 2016, Tehran will increase its support to the Kurdish Autonomous State in Iraq. Iran will attempt to disrupt the economic and energy arrangements between Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkey. This Iranian-Iraqi Kurdish cooperation will upset the Iranian allies in Baghdad where Iraqi Prime Minister al-Abadi is already heavily criticized. So we will see the Iraqi leadership struggle with a new political crisis. As for ISIS, the group will start to make significant losses in 2016, but it will not be defeated anytime soon. In fact, quite the opposite will appear in the mainstream media. In order to maintain their image as a formidable group, ISIS will increase its efforts to encourage more terrorist attacks in Europe and the Middle East. In short, more terrorist attacks is something that we can expect for 2016. What's more is that ISIS will expand its operations into Afghanistan. The thing is, as the Taliban sinks into an internal crisis, more and more Taliban field commanders will pledge fealty to ISIS. So in 2016, we will see a growing ISIS foothold in Afghanistan. In turn, this will trigger an Al-Qaeda-Taliban military confrontation against ISIS. Still, despite this conflict and its fragmentation, the Taliban will remain the most powerful insurgency group in Afghanistan. In fact, we will see some minor military successes for the Taliban in 2016. Considering the expansion of ISIS into Afghanistan, neighboring Turkmenistan will see an increase of radical Islamist groups trying to penetrate the eastern portion of the country. The local Central Asian governments will use the threat of Islamic militants to crack down on opposition factions. Further in the northeast, the local governments of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan will try to address their vulnerable economies by undergoing a privatization program which is meant to attract foreign investment. Despite their best efforts, it will not be enough to inspire investor confidence. In short, weak economic prospects and security threats will gradually destabilize all of Central Asia. In the course of the year, we will see Russia stepping in and presenting itself as a stabilizing force by introducing strict border controls. In Iran, President Rouhani will attempt to use the nuclear deal to campaign for his party and gain leverage against the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. However, this will not yield any results in 2016. Furthermore, Rouhani will be unable to limit the influence of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which controls a significant portion of the economy. Also, it's too soon for the Iranian population to notice the perks of returning to the global market. In short, there will be no significant changes to the domestic affairs of Iran. Instead, Tehran's biggest concern will come from the other side of the Gulf. In 2016, we will see an escalation of the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. Both sides will try to use proxy groups and client states to weaken the other. What's more is that the Saudi leadership will start to feel the pains of the low oil prices and Riyadh will have to finance a growing budget deficit. Moreover, the Saudi military intervention in Yemen will start to backfire. Thus far, the civil war in Yemen has forced more than 2 million civilians from their homes and it has destroyed what little infrastructure the country had. The Saudi military actions, which are endorsed by the United States, have deepened the political divisions and introduced sectarianism where previously there was none. Furthermore, the military confrontation has contributed to the strengthening of Al-Qaeda and ISIS presence in Yemen. For 2016, there is no end in sight for the Houthi rebellion. With so many ongoing conflicts, the Middle East is a dangerous place. None understand this better than Israel. Tel Aviv will continue to closely monitor the Syrian civil war as well as the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. The big change for Israel in 2016 will be its relationship with Turkey. As the civil war in Syria and the Saudi-Iranian rivalry are steadily becoming a complex web of coalitions and alliances, the chances for a worst-case scenario for Israel are increasing. It is due to this geopolitical dilemma that Tel Aviv will look to its western partners and Turkey to prepare for such a scenario. So in the course of the year, as Ankara starts to gain more influence in the region, the Israeli leadership will begin to improve relations with Turkey. 
As for the domestic affairs of Israel, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will persist in 2016. Attacks against Israeli civilians will occur in the West Bank and within Israel. The situation will escalate as both the Israelis and Palestinians will retaliate. Hezbollah will be emboldened by the fact that Israel is distracted and it will give the group more options in balancing their commitments to al-Assad and at the same time defend their own territories in Lebanon against Sunni rebels. Further south, in Egypt, a surprisingly stable year awaits the country. The low oil prices will enable President el-Sisi to push for critical energy subsidy reforms. And as the opposition will remain fragmented, the ruling party will have some political stability. The biggest challenge for Egypt will be the persistence of Islamic militants, which will hurt the tourism sector and drive up defense spending. All in all, 2016 will be a year in which conflict gains momentum. In part 2 of this prognosis, we will focus on East Asia, Africa and the Americas. For now, this was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I just want to extend special thanks to the following people. Their support and that of many others have contributed in creating this report. And if you would like to support Caspian report in creating more original content like this, please visit our Patreon page in the description. For now, thank you for watching, take care and Saul.